How's it going, everyone? Uh, David Jakinski here with the Title Financial Group and the ETF Think Tank. We bring ETFs to the marketplace for institutional investors. Uh, I am a portfolio manager here within the Title Financial Group. We're very excited to have uh, our esteemed guest today. Apologies if I mispronounce your last name, but Hari Krishnan. Uh, he's a distinguished financial expert currently serving as head of volatility at SCT Capital Management. Um, we're very excited to talk all things macro and volatility today. Hari, if you wouldn't mind, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how you got here today in, in your career and any current thoughts on the world around us that you want to jump off with. Well, uh, I got to this point in my career or onto the show because I met or I heard of Michael Guyad about a year ago, and I knew that he had quite a bit of um, quite a presence on Twitter and so on, on, on X. And his in, his journey has been quite a long one and mine has also been quite a long one. And um, I've covered many areas over the years uh, from being a quant to uh, being a macro strategist to being a vol guy and that I have retained. So I'm still a macro volatility specialist, uh, more on the hedge fund side, on the CTA side than uh, in your world, but um, I'm very interested in both, and I'm delighted to be on the show. And one of my goals in these shows is just to keep an open mind and see what where the conversation goes, and just uh, try and surf the wave, so to speak. So I'm delighted to be here. Sounds fantastic. If you could, can you just kick us off on what is a virtual storage strategy in the commodity space? I think that's something that is probably most of the uh, listeners today are probably not so familiar with. So, so yeah. what is that and, and how does that kind of work from a top down perspective? Well, I, I used to focus on the VIX and I bet your audience knows about the VIX. And the thing about the VIX is that if you could buy it when it had a handle of 12 or 10 and you didn't have to pay to hold it, it would be a great trade because you'd have a huge asymmetric payout. The VIX has never gone much below nine since its reported history, and it's gone somewhat over 80 uh, um, over the years. I mean, it peaked at slightly over 80, I think, in the financial crisis, and then really spiked during COVID. And so you'd have this great payout profile, but warehousing or carrying the VIX via the futures market is very difficult. And uh, historically, the average contango or the average price to roll from one month to the next has been about 5%. And you see that in clear evidence if you look at the ETN, the VXX, which has decayed 99.9999 something percent and had to have multiple reverse splits over time. So I was always interested in the VIX, which is very hard to replicate. So you cannot really store it. And that got me into various analogies with uh, the VIX and natural gas or electricity, which is super hard to store, or more, co or conversely, uh, the S&P and physical commodities that you actually can store. And so I got to this strange commodities space for someone like me with my background through the VIX and the S&P. And let me give you an example. So um, there is a strong bullish case for commodities over the long term. I mean, we can debate that. If the, if the audience disagrees, that's fine. But the bullish case includes many components. Uh, deglobalization, political conflicts that hopefully won't, but may be on the horizon, food security interests, a movement to green energy, which requires a lot of metals and so on, such as copper. So there are good reasons to believe that commodities may go into a strong secular bull market over the next decade or two or maybe beyond. And yet, at least until recently in the metals complex, let's say, uh, most commodities have been pretty cheap, and that's still the case in many areas. Uh, cotton is cheap. A lot of the agricultural commodities are cheap, cocoa accepted, but things like sugar, uh, corn and soybeans, wheat to a lesser degree, um, and natural gas is very cheap, at least in the US. And so the question arises, how do you gain exposure to those markets without actually having to be in the physical business of producing, storing, uh, or 
processing these things. And so the goal that I had was to, to find ways that are analogous to buying and holding the VIX for a hedging mandate where everyone is long the S&P and needs downside protection to apply the same ideas to the right side of the distribution. So in other words, how can I identify cheap commodities and warehouse them by using a combination of futures and options to have minimal carry plus significant upside capture in a rally. And that brings me to kind of a point, and please cut me off at any, any time. There's kind of the idea that many commodities have abundant supply for a long period of time, and then people just forget about it. Speculators drop out of the market, these assets become forgotten, and the risk is really asymmetric in your favor. Uh, so if corn is at three bucks or gas is at $1.75, as it was quite recently, the odds of it, it's going up to 275 are much higher than the odds of it's going down to 75 cents. Or even in percentage terms, the same idea applies. So if you can capture those sort of upside asymmetric payouts, which is the essentially the bread and butter of what hedge fund managers try and do, at least in the macro space, um, you have a winner. But the trouble is when physical commodities are cheap, typically you have to pay a lot to buy and roll them, yep. which required the re-engineering of a lot of techniques that I used in hedging mandates to manage upside exposure for cheap commodities. So harvest some of the costs through the options side and have that whole thing kind of hedge a yeah. short VIX position that inevitably will have costs associated with until it has a big payout. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it's very well said. I mean, as I mentioned uh, quite quickly, er most everyone is long equity markets. Yep. So downside insurance, moderate downside insurance tends to be expensive. Fine. Now, selling puts outright in size is a dangerous strategy. We can talk about that at another time. But if you try and translate that kind of thinking to interest rates or bonds, you get stumped, at least in the modern age, because options in the bond and short rate markets tend to be fairly efficiently priced. There's a two-sided market for protection against a rise in interest rates and a decline, an equally sized decline. So it's harder to find structural inefficiencies where one side of the market is bidding up the prices of insurance. Commodities are different though. I mean, think of corn. Corn is an easy case to explain in some ways. Um, if I'm a farmer or a, an elevator operator, a, a storage guy, um, I really need to hedge one-to-one -one against declines in price because if I'm holding inventory and the price crashes, it's going to hit my revenues head on. Whereas if I'm a cereal manufacturer, uh, the percentage that corn price movements, the percentage impact that corn price movements has on the price of a um, box of cereal is pretty low. Um, I've seen various breakdowns. It might be 23 cents uh, on the dollar for corn-based cereal is uh, reflects the price of all the all the commodity inputs to it, so sugar, um, corn, you know, wheat, whatever. So I'm really much less directly exposed. So what you see is that producers tend to hedge one-to-one -one, and end users tend to hedge indirectly in the options markets, which creates the same sort of structural imbalances that allow me to pay for carrying a long position that um, using the same techniques that I would use in the s p or other equity market hedges so it's a really interesting thing where virtual storage to me means how can i give investors or people who are in the industry miners um oil service companies oil producers or whatever how can i give them exposure to uh the underlying commodity with very low cost um assuming nothing happens if there's a flat line or a minor decline but significant upside exposure. So virtual storage means use financial instruments to create long exposure at low cost. Almost. The analogy, the analogy might be a someone who's in the steel business. So steel prices collapse, 
uh, and the owner goes out and buys scrap steel, sticks it in a warehouse. The cost of warehousing is quite insensitive to the price of the commodity, mm -hmm. and so he or she can hang out until the price until prices go up, and then sell the inventory into the market. In the futures market, it's trickier, and that's the problem that, in many cases, we claim to have solved. So, very interesting. So, have you seen a difference in how VIX is responding to volatility in the markets, just based on so much increased volume in zero DTE and, and shorter term options, both from the institutional and retail space? Is that something that's kind of changing how you're looking at the VIX? curve over over time. Uh, I've noticed just myself as a novice in the VIX space that it seems that the 30 day VIX has a lot more a lot uh, more muted responses just because there's so many yeah. more people trading short term options. The nine day VIX is definitely getting a lot more of a boost, um, but it almost feels like the 30 day VIX has this muted uh, upside to it that without like a huge band aid rip off and a climb towards a VIX of 30 40 50 as you said um it's just really really kind of condensed on the downside is that something you guys are seeing as well or do you have like a any explanation of how to trade around that in this market well i can try um i think that the, the, there used to be a lot more uh standalone volatility arbitrage funds out there that traded s p options and they had a bit more flexibility to take risk now a lot of these sorts of uh, traders or prop trading pods are sitting within bigger multi-strategy hedge funds. What the multi-strategy hedge funds do is they try and tightly control the risk in any one, at any one desk while diversifying their sources of alpha across desks. So they tend to be very strict in terms of imposing risk limits. Now, for all of the options audience out there, the crudest way to think about risk is in terms of Greeks, deltas, gammas, vegas, and so on. And so zero day to expiration options have been immensely useful for prop traders who perhaps are selling volatility in certain places and have tight risk limits to cover their end of day risk. So at three o'clock or 3.45, when at New York time, you have an open-ended position, you're a volatility relative value manager in S&P options, you can go out and buy zero DTE options near the close, and you won't get a phone call in the middle of the night or whenever saying that you breached your risk limits. Now, this was, I think, the initial phase of the zero DTE distortions, where if you looked at the term structure of volatility for the S&P, you actually saw elevated levels at zero days, and then a sharp dip down, and then normalization of the curve further out. Mm -hmm. Now, this has been regime specific. It's been in a pretty bullish market. Even 2022 was not a high volatility regime. And so in the two to three years where zero DTEs have not cornered the market, but become equals, if not the majority of open contracts in S&Ps, you do see a pickup in the zero day to expiration at the money implied vol relative to say the one day or the two day to expiration ones. Now, what does that mean? I mean, the naive thing to do, maybe it isn't even naive, is to sell straddles every night if that's all you do or to do sell, um, you know, iron flies, meaning you sell a straddle and cover the cover the wings on both sides or you do a condor or something like that. Forget about the technical terms, but you're basically selling volatility to try and monetize the, or to accept the risk transfer from people who have to cover their overnight risk and in return generate some alpha. I think that sort of strategy from what I know has become increasingly popular. Mm -hmm. What I would conclude from that is that um, eventually the pendulum will swing the other way and there'll be dampening at the zero day to expiration point, which will create opportunities in the other direction. I don't know this for sure, 
But I do believe that uh, weekly options are very, or two to three day options are very attractively priced relative to zeros. Mm -hmm. I'm not making an investment recommendation, but buying a straddle that's two or three days out, selling a straddle that's overnight, if you do it at the right times, if you manage the various, if you manage the gamma risk. Uh, as of today, probably is an attractive strategy. You got to be careful here in the ETF world. You say too attractive of a strategy online, and all of a sudden there's going to be like a filing overnight. <laughs> That'll be the uh, the three day options ETF series. So, yeah, um, well, I'm not I'm not suggesting anything. All I'm saying is that what I will say is um, I didn't even know that I would become known for weekly and shorter tenor options when I wrote my first book, but I did almost purely by accident because I was interested in what would fancily or fancifully, maybe both, be called uh, the econophysics of asset prices or asset price returns, where you get fatter tails for very short horizons. So you don't see a, if you normalize by standard deviation, you don't see 10 standard deviation moves on monthly on a monthly basis from any market. But over one minute horizons, you do. And that fat tail dynamic decays as you as you extend the horizon. And uh, so I was arguing in favor of short dated options because I felt that the market couldn't correctly price them. Yep. Uh, but the mania that ensued where people attached, a few people at least attached my name to it, really surprised me. Someone said that I had advocated hourly options or every minute uh, expirations, not flex options where you negotiate with a market maker or a flow provider. Oh, actually expire. But actually listing those things. And uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, I find it amusing and interesting that people have gone that way, and I respect that. But um, it was a surprise to me, definitely. Sometimes you need to hedge that lunchtime break, you know? <laughs> exactly. So you mentioned uh, 2022 as a volatility environment. That was a, a unique year where equities were pulling back, but vol didn't actually really spike up with equities. How sure. internally does that affect a strategy like yours? And, and what do you do in response to a market like that? Well, as a hedger, uh, 2022 was a good year. Yeah. Uh, but there are different prongs to the hedging that we do. So we try and hedge against a flash crash with a little bit of fixed premium cost. Mm -hmm. We hedge against downward trending but well-behaved markets using spread trades. Let's say. So if I restrict it to the S&P, we would trade put spreads or put butterflies to monetize the skew, but still capture downside. Uh, and then we have longer dated options, which are basically um, – bets on a reshaping or a, re, a, a, a change in risk appetite. So if you buy a, long, a very long dated option, let's say two years is fairly long dated, a leap. Uh, if investors go from greedy to fearful, it doesn't matter too much if you build an out of the money put or a call, the bulk of your P&L comes from a, a repricing of risk. So how much is it just quite frankly looking for the cheapest risk hedge and betting on that just being underpriced versus the macro outlook tied into that as well? Well, if I put my hedging hat on, so I'm, I mean, I think of two different things. I have, there's an engine room aspect to what I try and do. Maybe that's a bad phrase, an engineered aspect. And then there's a macro side. Mm -hmm. The engineering comes first. Because as a money manager, you need to have repeatable trades that you understand and you can implement either systematically or discretionarily based on the state of the world. And if I had to give a message to the audience, the number one message I would give is there is no one option strategy that is good all the time. Every option strategy has a regime-based sensitivity to it. So if volatility is expensive, I don't want to be going out and buying vol unless I have a very strong view that vol will go higher. So the more disadvantageous the regime is for a given spread or a given type of strategy, 
the stronger your conviction has to be to stick that trade on. So the VIX is at 40. Sorry. So, you know, a lot of people used to tell me, well, if the VIX is between 10 and 20, you want to be a buyer of the VIX. Uh, sorry, you want to be a relative value trader. If it goes above, I'm getting my numbers a little wrong. If it's between, if it's below a threshold, pardon my um, sloppiness, you want to be a buyer of the VIX. If it's above another threshold, you want to be a seller. And if it's higher still, you want to be a buyer again because everything's falling apart. Now, I would challenge people who buy the VIX or who buy volatility in the S&P when the VIX is above, say, 35, to demonstrate to me without very deft timing that they can make money consistently unless they were already in the position mm -hmm. and they managed it over time. And so I believe that you're right, that people may be right that maybe they did make money buying a, an S and P straddle when the VIX was at when at the money vol was at thirty on the S and P, uh, but it was in my opinion a difficult to justify bet unless they had other very strong con confirming and cor corroborating information to support that. And that's where the macro side of it might come in. So, yeah, so the, the pressure is higher if you're doing a strategy that is not well conditioned to the regime to have a very strong view. VIX spiking in March 2020 is very different than other phenomenons, right? You were probably looking at the deployment of potential Fed capital, et cetera, coming out of government, and that probably capped your uh, upside exposure to what the VIX might be, right? I would imagine an environment like that is the exact scenario where volatility is high, you might systematically say, historically, maybe this is actually another long position, but the geopolitical and uh, macroeconomic environment and, and fiscal spending uh, deems otherwise. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. And the broader message is that for me, getting by is important. Having strategies and devices that I can apply for whatever mandate I may have that allow me to get by with managed risk, I think is very significant because you're not always going to have a strong view. Yep. And it's increasingly difficult just to stay in cash if you don't have a view. Yep. So in uh, the pre-show, we were talking a little bit about the volatility being priced into all political elections, but specifically this political election where the, the jump in volatility in this election is seemingly so much higher than in past elections. Can you talk a little bit about that? Is that a, a vol, uh, a position that you're trying to take advantage of, or is that something you kind of stay away from? It seems like there's- I, I'm, I would be, if I were a purely discretionary trader, I would be very tempted, yeah. certainly. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen this before, uh, and, and it, it, it occurs many years where um, volatility might be depressed for equity indices going into Christmas or going into certain months of the year. And people are very surprised when the occasional December, let's say in 2018, I think, becomes a violent one. Uh, so the temptation here would be to say, well, vol is rich in November, or S&P vol is, so let me buy October and December vol, or October and January 25 vol, and sell a bit of November. Mm -hmm. Mathematically, that's an attractive trade. Just maybe not mathematically, but just in terms of looking at the structure of volatility conditioned on um, expiration. And I would argue that there is a lot of complacency built into the market from here to November that may, be, may lend itself to some long volatility trades along the way. No recommendations again. But I wouldn't just go out and sell November, or I wouldn't do a uh, some kind of time-dependent barbell where I sell November and mechanically try and hedge it with September and January of 25. It's a little bit risky because even if September richens up and you're making money on that trade, it may put a lot of pressure on November. Yep. So it's hard to say exactly how November will reprice um, before the event. And that's the danger with a lot of these trades. You think that you have them right, you think you have an edge, and you probably do, but you cannot hang out until a few days before expiration or even a, a week before expiration to uh, 
see how things are going. You have to have some mechanism for rolling out of the trade early enough. So moving on to the commodity side of the portfolio, um, I, I feel like you probably expect to get this question, but how was your year in cocoa? <laughs> how did how has cocoa treated you this year? I know that's an asset class that a lot of people said was really hard to find a consistent trend in. Is that mm -hmm. something that's on your radar, especially in this kind of mean reversion process, or is that something that wouldn't even be considered? Um, I, I I hate to say it, I have had no position in cocoa. Uh, I, the main positions have been in metals, energies, and grains, and the reason for that is cocoa doesn't have very liquid options. Yep, at least not ones that I have access to. So. The warehousing concept did not apply here. Mm -hmm. um, the trend following community does capture some of these gains. Mm -hmm. And going forward, as this warehousing concept expands, uh, the trend following component will increase. It won't be restricted to the markets where I'm warehousing. Yep. Um, so I hate to, hate to admit it, but I have not been in the cocoa trade. Yep. Um, and you know, many trend followers weren't in the trade too. And the reason they weren't in the trade is because maybe they thought too much. I hate to say this because that's what I, I pride myself on doing, but um, Coco didn't have big trends for many years. Right. So I would not be surprised if some diversified trend followers just threw it out of the out of the basket. It was it was um, a hard asset to drive momentum off of. So I think a lot of them, as you alluded to, just kind of excluded them from their universe. Um, what about some of the recent pickup we've seen as of late in copper and how that might relate to both the uh, battery metal space, but also just the greater state of the world right now with uh, everyone trying to figure out what is going to appreciate while currencies depreciate, while all of our, uh, our, our governments around the world continue to have huge deficits. So do you have any specific macro thoughts on copper and how it's relating to the rest of our economy right now? Well, uh, copper is a tough trade right now. I know it's had a significant rally. I won't talk about what I'm doing systematically so much. I'll just put my finger in the air, for lack of a better phrase, and talk a little bit about copper. Copper has a very strong structural tailwind, which is that uh, as um, traditional fossil fuels are de-emphasized, which is maybe a long-term trajectory, it may happen more quickly, metals will be required in scale. Um, electric cars require a lot more metal. Uh, rewiring the grid requires huge amounts of copper um, and so on. So copper and other metals will be in heavy demand um, structurally over time. The problem with copper, and again, this is not a very systematic comment, it's more discretionary is that it is sensitive to global economic growth. Mm -hmm. So if the doomsday um, people out there are correct, or if we go into a recession even, if this high level of rates, even with no real increase, is unsustainable over, over the medium term, I would not be surprised if copper went down. I do not trade on that basis. I wait for things to happen and then adapt dynamically in the options markets. But um, the bull case for copper is very strong long term. But if we do go into a recession, various physical commodities could go down. Now, that sounds like a cop out. And I've heard a lot of economists make comments such as a bearish short term and bullish long term. So they have everything covered. I hope I'm not coming across with that. I'm just saying I can present a shorter term bear case, which is that things have been very frothy up to now. Risky, risk assets have done extremely well, even with higher rates. Yeah, and I mean, the majority, it, of the reality of the world is the best traders will say most of the time, like, I don't really know, it's like 55, 45, I'll tell you which way the coin is flipping, but there's very few times where you have supreme confidence beyond that. And it does occur, um, but it's not something that happens on a daily, regular basis. So I don't think you're coming across that way at all. Thank you very much. This is a fantastic show. Um, can well, I, uh, I, I appreciate that. What I would say is that if you trade a lot, so if I put a, yet a different hat on, which is kind of my uh, kind of a machine learning hat, if you if you trade enough, or even a, st a statistical arbitrage hat, that's more more accurate. 
if you trade enough, then you have 52% of the time winners and 48% of the time losers. You will do fantastically as long as you can manage your extreme event risk. For most of us who trade in a macro framework, the goal is not to turn skew the odds from 52-48 to 80-20, but to skew the payout mm -hmm. so that I only lose a relatively small amount if I'm wrong, and I can really do well if I'm correct. And so it's really creating that asymmetry that's important for the macro uh, mindset. Whereas for the um, stat arb mindset, the goal is to trade a lot, manage your costs of impact execution, and control the tails, either with mm -hmm. accurate risk management or some kind of an overlay. And they're very two. They're two very different dynamics, but um, you need to kind of figure out which one you want to use. So can we move on to uh, the macro side of this? We, we discussed sure. briefly pre-show. Um, I asked you uh, the impossible question of inflation, deflation, or stagflation. Um, but if you could just tie into that, maybe your thoughts on where we are with employment, productivity from artificial intelligence. Um, I think a lot of people are waiting to see employment numbers erode. There are some that think that employment benefits are just not low enough and people are finding uh, alternative forms of work, whether it's not sustainable for their income spending or not. Um, but where are we in this cycle? Is Are we going to see continued sticky inflation? Is it going to turn to stagflation and hurt the employee? Um, or are we going to revert back down to deflation? Well, the thing that makes this so hard, this problem so hard, is all the feedback loops. Okay. So... I was talking to Ilya Buchoev the other day in New York, and he, he's very aware of this in many markets, more so than I am. But he will say things such as, if oil prices go up, oil is an input to inflation. So inflation goes up in the US, let's say. When inflation goes up, yields may go up as a response, whether it's a good response or no, let, let the viewer decide. As rates go up, it's possible that there will be more of a an incremental bid for U.S. bearing, U.S. yielding assets, USD yielding assets, which will cause flows into the dollar or exchange into the dollar, which will have a negative impact on oil prices. So you have some feedback loops that are stabilizing. You have others that are destabilizing. Uh, more commonly, when speculators pile into a position, it, the market is overcrowded and they have to pull out. What you're seeing here is a very complicated tug of war. I don't know exactly what the game would be between Fed jawboning, Fed policy, whether however effective it may be, data that comes in, and this notion that the ship can be sailed in a very straight way through incremental changes that are data dependent over time. Um, and that makes this problem very hard to understand because uh, um, I would argue that there are more destabilizing outcomes than stabilizing ones at this point. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think it's that, again, I'm speaking personally and not putting my work hat on. I, I'm very surprised from a high level point of view that with interest rates as high and sticky as they are relative to the recent history, that risk assets are where they are. The credit is as tight as it is. I know that there are some very good economic numbers coming out, as you pointed out, with inflation, at least um, employment, at least stated employment numbers, and so on. But just from a very high level perspective, I am shocked that high and sticky rates, with no sign of a very sharp decrease in the near future, um, leads to a sustainable risk asset environment. I mean, there, there are some that say when the the over indebted entity is the government's and not the corporations that it could even be slightly inflationary with short term rates. I don't know if I necessarily fall into that camp. I do think there's some credence to uh, high yield spreads are actually cleaner in quality than they were because of the mass availability of uh, private credit. And so anyone who couldn't get debt in traditional uh, forms found debt otherwise and that almost like 
was a self-fulfilling loop to clean up the quality of the indexes, if that makes some sense. Um, it does. I, I, I'm, I'm not fully on top of this today, but I think high yield is more energy dependent than it was in terms of the composition. And so as long as energy prices hold up, inflation is actually not horrendous for high yield. So maybe there are distortions of the type that you or changes of the type you, you mentioned in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Any thoughts on uh, in, in the real estate market also uh, specifically on, on rent prices? I think that's something that from a macro perspective is kind of holding up the linchpin of this entire real estate market, at least on the residential side. We uh, had a recent video discussing how the delta between rental prices and, and purchase prices today at these interest rates, um, and how can how long can a gap like that persist that seems to be persisting across the entire developed world right now? Well, to, to some degree, it's contingent on the average duration of fixed rate mortgages, mm -hmm. as I understand it. So as the more as more peel off, which may occur in the next year or two, I would expect there to be more pressure on the market. But it's also something that downside in the market could cause additional sellers to come to the market who are selling for inopportune reasons. They have to relocate for a job, et cetera. So there's there's reason why I think that supply could potentially spike on the downside. If you're looking for skewed bets one way or the other, that's one that I constantly think there's a an interesting way to hedge up skew in the downside just because any economic uncertainty um, would probably r rock both markets and hurt employment and, and, and probably therefore hurt residential real estate even further. So. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, I mean, we are in a strange stage in, in, or an interesting stage in markets where um, one of the great things about the U.S. is how encouraging to innovation it is or how, how supportive it is to innovation. One of the negative attributes, although I think it's less significant, but it is worth mentioning, is a lot of decisions are made on FOMO. So if someone else has some technology and I don't have it, I might indiscriminately fund um, that activity. And I think in, in the AI space, and I'm not trying to be bearish on AI in general, I'm just saying there is a lot of indiscriminate credit or money being thrown at various companies in such a way that makes me think that sentiment is overly optimistic. We want a cake without paying for it. This whole earnings quarter was like great top line, great bottom line. And they're like, oh, and if you want this growth to continue, guess what? That requires an R&D budget. <laughs> and then yep. the market was like, wow, that's a really big R&D budget, like across the board. Um, can you please do that a little bit cheaper? <laughs> we asked for a revision on that. So um, do you change, is there any difference in how you think about markets uh, during earnings season versus macro season, right? Uh, is there a difference in philosophy and how you manage your macro portfolio when most of the movements are going to be coming from com company earnings versus from macroeconomic events? No, nothing. Um, it purely index focused. I don't do anything on the individual name side. I'm strictly macro. Um, maybe I overly restrict myself, but I only trade major markets. I don't. I don't have a direct focus on earnings. I will accept that volatility can pick up going into earnings season, especially early in the season. But it's not something I consciously adjust for. So. Uh, I leave so, it to the, to, the on, to others. On the macro side, what is the indicator that you used to really like that has proven to be almost useless in the last couple of years, and vice versa? What are some of the newer kind of data points? Sequencing, sequencing, I used to love, and it's been quite useless. Useless recently. So sequencing means that rates move first with FX, mm -hmm. then equity indices respond. And then real assets, commodities move. And then once they go up, so you can measure it sort of in terms of trend. So bonds rally, stocks rally, commodities rally, bonds start selling off, stocks start selling off, commodities start selling off. So it's kind of a sequentially predictable cycle. 
even if you couldn't say what the timing was, you can say, well, this will move first and then that's going to move and so on. That cycle has been broken. Uh, even pre, uh, even before the 2020s, the, the cycle was broken because of the persistently low interest rate regime. So from, say, the great financial crisis to 2020 or even to the present, uh, until, let's say, until 2021, uh, rates were not communicating information to other assets in the way that they used to. And so that predictability went. And now it's unclear to me which way the direction goes. I always thought rates led everything. Mm -hmm. But now I'm thinking that commodities take something like oil. Maybe oil is the premier financial asset. It's, a, it's predicated on the dollar because it, that's its uh, denominator. Uh, it's a measure of risk asset appetite. Uh, it's a measure of inflation. Um, it just covers more or less everything at this point. It's a measure of global growth, demand for global growth. So I do wonder if commodities are now um, more important than ever in terms of um, maybe not leading the cycle, but driving the cycle. And I'm very, one other reason I became very interested in commodities, which is more of a personal reason, is that even if we go more and more virtual, even if AI begins to take over more and more things, the we still require energy even to power these things. We have to eat. We have to worry about things that relate to our physical well-being and the world's well-being. And these all require an emphasis on physical commodities. There's no getting around it. And so I think it's a wonderful uh, barbell, conceptual barbell to have where you think of um, um, commodities and alongside with some of the more advanced automated technologies that exist out there in a balanced way. So. Without giving out too many secrets, obviously, what is the... What are some of the newer things that you are considering, at least conceptually on the macro side, um, that might be replacing something like that? Well, we're seeing a little more disper uh Oh, on the macro side. Well, I, 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 I was going to dive into FX. Please. But, uh, yeah, by, by all means, take this where, if that's where you want to go with this, let's go there. Uh, but, uh, well, I, I should come back to your question, though. I don't want to be. Um, uh, on the FX side, what I am seeing is with greater divergence in interest rate policy, that's when currencies start to become interesting again, because you'll see more spread. Uh, every currency is really a spread, an explicit spread uh, between two two countries, two countries' currencies. So uh, there, I would expect to see more interest on the macro side. Um, the the U.S. was always the one in in the uh, 2010s to be the first to start cutting rates, and I felt like there was always this like benefit to being um, in the front of that line as opposed to the back of that line. Is that something you see as well or no? Something I used to do. I, I remember the ECB would always lag behind the U.S., yeah. as you pointed out. And so whatever policy was being applied in the U.S., you could infer with some lag would be applied elsewhere over time, Japan being the notable exception, you know, sort of doing its own thing. In fact, one could argue that Japan was 20 years ahead of the game, 25 years ahead of the game. But uh, yeah, I mean, on the AI side, uh, I'm actually optimistic that AI will not take over investing because you're dealing with a situation where the signal to noise ratio is quite low. So, um, you know, it's hard to predict uh, financial market uh, directions very accurately. And so AI will always be, and maybe not always, but for a long time will be a quite an open uh, part of finance. It will be used, and it is being used in many ways. But it will. You, I do not. Pers I have not recently seen any AI pure AI hedge fund that is out there. I mean, there are. We use a lot of AI in our own processes, but we're mixing AI with more traditional ways of managing money, trend following, contrarian trading, and so on. It's right. just a way to structure the decisions 
so that you don't just on an ad hoc basis say, oh, I'm going to look at a 10 day, 50 day moving average crossover or mm -hmm. a breakout with a three month look back horizon. You use AI, you use machine learning to decide what features are most appropriate for splitting up and down periods. Um, but having said that, you're still relying on human intervention in terms of deciding what features are in general terms important and uh, how to design the thing. And you have to do it that way because uh, it is a very noisy problem. It's not like automated driving. Automated driving is a different problem where if you get it wrong, it's catastrophic. But it's not that hard given modern technology to get it right nearly all of the time. Yeah, it's a good source of the signal to noise uh, comments you made, made just to describe that a little bit further. I think you're intending to mean that you know, most of these large language models are meant to pick up a number of historical facts, piece them together and have confirmation of that fact from more sources. Whereas if you take something like oil prices that traded at everything from zero dollars to one hundred and fifty dollars, that's really hard for these large language models to make any sense of. Although that being said, some of the largest hedge funds in the world I do know are, have their own elements and they probably have uh, likely cracked that code, um, but I, I do agree. It, it seems like now is a better use case to source the information that you need and figure out what information might be most useful to make a decision, as opposed to maybe making the decision on that itself. Well, it, exactly, and uh, you know, your your what you suggested is absolutely correct. Um, no matter how good a machine you have, and this is a bit of an oversimplification, but no matter how good a machine you have, if oil has if the machine has never seen a negative oil futures price. It has no clean frame of reference. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I take the guinea pig who we have at home, we've more or less seen him from every angle in every shade of light. We can recognize him fairly well. And the human visual system, which um, is a very significant part of our brain function, can be replicated to a great degree by machines simply because if you stack enough images up and give them to a machine, things don't change as dynamically as they do for, say, financial time series. Um, so um, it's a very hard technical problem. It's a very intensive data problem. But computer vision is a much easier problem to crack than financial market prediction. In fact, we even have a little experiment at the office where we try and identify financial time series. If I gave you uh, a year of corn price history, let's say just a candlestick chart, mm -hmm. open, high, low, and close, could you tell me it was corn? Probably, no, probably not. Or, I mean, I could say that, well, that, that might look like gas because it's a bit more fat tailed or it has bigger contango, you know, bigger roll down costs and so on. But even the identification problem is not obvious in financial markets, let alone the prediction problem. Yeah. Yeah. And there's just too many weird human events that just everything from tr like how many people are trading the VIX to now trading zero DTE options. Um, the world has never seen what like retail, how retail would respond to a, you know, 50% pullback in the market. So it's, are they going to be as eager to trade options? There's no way to really know, right? There's, yeah, and that feedback loop actually has an impact on what happens. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Because most of these strategies on your end are, with all due respect, trying to take into account what they're doing. If they're overpricing the volatility of the one-day option, you guys are going to look at the two- to three-day option and harvest it in a little bit of a more efficient manner, right? And so if they're, you know, went from 15 to 35 percent of the trading volume and they go back down to 20 that's going to totally change where the alpha comes from in this market um, yep yep, yep, yep. Citadel is really really hoping they stay in this market so <laughs> um, yeah harry this has been a, a phenomenal show thank you so much for all your wisdom please if, if there's any final thoughts that you want to leave us with um, and also where we can find you or any information that you're putting out there, please um, thank you again. This has been really a lot of fun. Well, I'm around, and if people have questions about uh, the virtual storage problem or hedging, uh, 
I'd be delighted to try and help. So uh, I'll leave it at that.